Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Basketball Conference, the ACC football podcast. My name is Joey Weaver. I'm a Georgia Tech grad and a Louisville fan. He's Mike McDaniel. He's a Virginia Tech grad and a Notre Dame fan. Mike, first question, is 2018 Miami a quarterback away from being you know, a national powerhouse? Yeah, even without a quarterback, they're a national powerhouse. But with a quarterback, yeah, they're a final four contender, like a serious playoff contender. Like they're right, they're right there. A um, lot coming back on offense, a lot coming back on defense. Limited ceiling if Malik Rozier is the starter, uh, unless he takes a major step forward. Uh, but, you know, if they go a different route and they can get more out of the downfield passing game, there's no reason why Miami can't be one of the three or four best teams in college football next season. Yeah, Malik Rozier, 54% completion, 14 oh, interceptions in God. 2017. Oh, that ain't going to get it done. No. Uh, that was literally the the difference in this team, uh, being able to take that next step. Um, they had a lot of the pieces in place, even after Mark Walton's injury. I mean, they were hanging in there on offense, if not for Malik Rozier's struggles in the passing game. So that seems to be the big gap. Mike, we had Miami going 10-2 and two in 2017. Both of us did. They ended up finishing 10 and three, including 10 and one in the regular season. They had a game canceled uh, due to Hurricane Irma. Um, pretty much what we expected, I think maybe even a little better than we expected. But in retrospect, they started out the season 10 and 0. And we had a lot of banter back and forth with Miami fans on here. I know Cam Underwood was calling us the We Hate Miami podcast, you know, whatever. And, we, you know, I think we're both pretty honest about the fact that Miami's not our favorite team. But just objectively, there were several games that Miami won and they they were either way closer than they should have been or just flat out they should have lost the game. I mean, to me, that's not what I'm looking for from a, a dominant 10-0 and team that's trying to nudge its way into the playoff, uh, playoff race. Tell me, I, I mean – are we being too harsh here, or was this a little bit of a fluky season for there for a little bit for Miami? Uh, it was fluky a little bit. Uh, I mean, Miami was very good. Uh, they kind of debunked a theory about, I, I wouldn't say completely debunked it, but when we were talking about how Virginia Tech was going to roll them and Notre Dame was going to roll them, and they go out and they combine to outscore those two opponents 69 to 18. Nice. That's no fluke. Yeah, nice. Um, now, a few weeks before those games, you know, mid-October, you know, they had a one-point win against Georgia Tech, an eight-point win against Syracuse, and a five-point win against North Carolina, which leads to my next question, Joey. How many games did they win this year in spite of Malik Rozier, a quarterback? Um, they beat Duke 31-6, to and Rozier only completed 57% of his passes, two touchdowns and a pick. They beat Virginia Tech 28-10, to Malik Rozier, two touchdowns, three picks. They beat Virginia 44-28, three touchdowns, two picks. But then let's look at the losses, shall we? Um, they lose their final three games of the year, which really sours things on Miami because they started 10-0. and And, you know, for people like you and I who kind of saw this coming at some point, we even we thought it was a surprise that they lost to Pittsburgh. Malik Rozier, 15-34, 187, and two touchdowns. Only completed 44% of his passes in that game. The Clemson loss in the ACC championship, Malik Rozier, 14 of 29, 110 yards, no touchdowns, two picks, only completed 48.3% of his passes in that game. The Wisconsin game in the Orange Bowl, a loss, of course, 34 to 24. Malik Rozier, 11 of 26, 203 yards, 42% completion percentage with one touchdown and three interceptions. He had three touchdowns and five picks over his final three games, and he averaged a little bit uh, well, really, just right around 45% of his uh, his passes were completed. I mean, that's really, really rough. Really rough. And it's really a microcosm of the season because there were a lot of games where Malik Rozier didn't perform well, but they had enough talent around Rozier to kind of cover things up. But then you play more talented defenses and, and Pittsburgh, uh, you know, say what you want about their defense. They had a great, great game plan the day after Thanksgiving and they were able to shut down the Miami offense, and they came out and won that football game. Clemson and Wisconsin were two of the best defenses on Miami's schedule. Of course, with Clemson being the ACC championship game and Wisconsin in the Orange Bowl, those two games Miami didn't exactly sign up for, but those are the games that Miami wants to play, and they want to play in a game like the Orange Bowl. 
Uh, they want to play in the ACC championship game, have an opportunity to win the conference. And those are two of the best defenses they saw. And Malik Rozier struggled even more than usual. And they weren't able to cover up the ills that he had in his game. So downfield passing game was a major issue for Malik Rozier and Miami this year. It's a reason why they ended up losing their final three games. It really begs the question, as much talent as Miami has moving forward, what is their ceiling? I think their ceiling is extremely high if Malik Rozier improves or if they go with somebody else. But if we get the same Malik Rozier in 2018 that we got in 2017, I think Miami is a 9 or 10 win team again. I would agree. I mean, I think that all the pieces are there, like you're saying, that this could be a very uh, a, a team that makes a lot of noise in the national stage, pushes for a playoff berth and such. But it's clear at this point that Malik Rozier is not going to cut it. Um, there were six games, Mike, this year that he failed – to complete better than 50% of his passes. He was 50% or worse six times out of 13 games. That's a, that's a team that's vying for a playoff spot. You're not going to tell me that that's not a, a reasonable number to improve on. Not only that, but that was also five of his last seven games. He, he put up those numbers, you know, 50% or worse. And it's like, that also indicates he's not getting better. And, and if anything, he's putting something on film that teams are starting to figure out. Um, so I think I mean the, the passing game was clearly feast or famine for Miami all season long, and that seems to be the real weak link right now. You know the running back thing has kind of been a little bit of a by committee situation. Uh, Travis Homer took over for an injured Mark Walton. He didn't really do a great job as the bell cow. Uh, he, he was a guy that was really good in short bursts, but not a guy that you're going to do a lot of carrying 25 times a game and you know, having him be really successful over those 25 carries. They got some from DJ Dallas late in the year that was pretty good, but all to say that I think if Miami puts together a little bit more of a consistent passing game, they are a force to be reckoned with, and they might be favored in just about every game they play in 2018. So, I mean, that's how close I think that they are. Best win on the year, Mike, I would say that the, the home win against number three Notre Dame, um, that was a game coming in that we thought that Miami had kind of been skating by for a while thought that they they might really get taught a lesson there. And instead, they were the ones doing the lesson teaching. Um, they made an absolute mess of Notre Dame in that game. It was a really brilliant display. Of their last three games and the losses, I would say the worst one, probably the pit loss. That was the one that kind of came out of the blue. Uh, a team that is definitely not nearly as talented as Miami is. Um, a, a team that really exposed a couple of the weaknesses that Miami had. So I, to me, they had probably their best win and their worst loss within a, about a two-week span. So uh, kind of a, a turbulent way to end the year for Miami, but it was a bit of a turbulent season as much as one can be with 10 straight wins and then three straight losses to end it. Yeah, uh, the pit loss, uh, that's the worst loss. I think the Clemson loss is more embarrassing because I think Miami – Miami fans, especially, they were made to believe that they had talent and, you know, the coaching and and the scheme to hang with Clemson. And then Clemson just made an absolute mockery of their football team in that game, in the ACC championship game. So while the Pittsburgh loss was a stunning upset the week before, I think the fact that they go to the ACC championship game and they Miami talked about all year how they were ready for for prime time and ready for the you know everything that comes with being one of the top teams in the country and they lose by five touchdowns to Clemson, the ACC championship game. That was not a great look, uh, not a great look at all. So I think that's even more embarrassing than the loss to Pitt. as stunning as the Pittsburgh loss was on the road. It was on a short week. It was a day after Thanksgiving, uh, a lot's going on that week. That's, um, it, I wouldn't say it's an understandable loss. Um, I expected Miami to lose to Clemson. I did not expect them to lose to Pittsburgh, so I was more surprised by the Pittsburgh loss. But I, I think the Clemson loss, to a degree, could be could be seen as a more embarrassing loss of the two. That's fair, Mike. No major changes on the coaching staff moving forward. Uh, obviously, we kind of know what we're going to get from Mark Richt. Um, he Obviously, a long track record at Georgia. Good. Uh, now, a couple years in at Miami. Yeah, good um, in general. Really good hire. My question is more about Manny Diaz, Mike. So what we're seeing from Manny Diaz is a, a remarkably effective Miami defense. In year three, this could have a chance to be one of the better three-year runs that we've seen from Miami or any team in the ACC defensively in several years. My question to you is, this is a guy that at 43 years old has never had a head coaching opportunity. 
How long is it until Manny Diaz jumps and takes a head coaching opportunity? And or how long is it going to take for somebody to offer him something that will be really enticing? Because I don't know if we can realistically believe at this point that he's never been offered one. Right. I mean, I think it's definitely coming. Um, I mean, Miami's defense was leaps and bounds better in 2017 than it was in 2016. And 2018, it should be even better. And they had so, so much young talent on that defense. And they're only going to get better. Another year of experience. A lot of guys returning. Really talented secondary. Uh, talented young secondary. Solid front seven. Can really rush the passer. Look, I mean, if Miami's defense does anything similar to what they did um, this past season, I mean, I, I think Manny Diaz is going to put himself in great position next offseason to at least have an opportunity to entertain some offers which I'm sure he's done in the past, but I think it gets more serious when your team is on the national stage and you're one of the top five or 10 teams in the country every week and you're you're playing in big games and you're performing on the highest level and your defense is really good. I mean, I think Manny Diaz is going to have opportunities if he wants to leave Miami, that's for sure. Yeah, Miami bringing back 70% of their production from this year and next year. So, they, I mean, they are set. Uh, overall, as a team... Mike, any idea how much they bring back uh, overall, percentage-wise? Uh, well, they bring back most of their defense and most of their offense. I don't know, 70%? 69 percent, Mike. 69 nice. percent. Nice. Nice indeed. Uh, pretty good. That's 48th nationally, and that's a team that was already pretty damn good. So. Miami has a big opportunity in front of them in 2018 uh, to establish a little more consistency and maybe finally convince us all that the U is back. I love the schedule for them. Yeah, this sets up pretty nicely. They start out the season, Mike, in what normally would be a very a, a bit of an intimidating game against LSU on a neutral field. I'll tell you right now, I don't really know how intimidating LSU is going to be in 2018, at least not to start the year. I, I think this is an opportunity for them to make a statement right out the gate. New game is they're going to be a game that Miami plays in the regular season where they're not going to be favored. Ooh, this is an interesting game. Let's look. Savannah State obviously favored at oh. Toledo, obviously okay, favored. Well, 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 well. LSU favored. Yes. Okay. Continue. I think yeah. I do yeah, care. yeah. I'll say favored against LSU. Savannah State, yes. Toledo, yes. FIU, yes. North Carolina at home, yes. Florida State at home, I think. But it, maybe it depends a little bit on what Florida State has done to that point in the season. We'll see. At Virginia, yes. At Boston College, probably. Friday night could get a little weird. Careful there. Home against Duke, yes. At Georgia Tech, yes, most likely. This is getting into November, so again, it depends a little bit on what everyone else has done. But probably favored against Georgia Tech. Um, at Virginia Tech is probably the other dicey one here. I think realistically, there's about three games here that they might not be favored in, and it's home or it's the neutral site against LSU to start the year, home against Florida State at the beginning of October, and on the road at Virginia Tech right before Thanksgiving. And I agree, and I think they'll be favored in all of those games. I think the one where, like you mentioned, could get dicey is the Florida State game in mid-October, um, or early October, I guess, October 6th. That's the one. Because, um, I mean, Florida State, look, I mean, they have they have Virginia Tech in the opener, but they have a pretty manageable early season schedule. So, I mean, I'm interested to see, if, especially if they, if they get past Virginia Tech, uh, they have Samford, S-A-M-F-O-R-D, not Stanford, Samford, they're at Syracuse, home against Northern Illinois at Louisville before they play Miami. Um, if they beat Virginia Tech, I think they're 5-0 and when they face off against the Hurricanes. So I guess that would be the one game that I'm not 100% sure of, but Miami's at home, so I'll give them the nod right now. Because Miami, I think, will be undefeated too at that point. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think you're probably talking about an undefeated matchup. That's probably a, probably an uh, 8, 8, 8 p.m. Saturday ABC kind of kind of set up there on uh so um that one sets up pretty nice, i think for yeah all day tailgate that would be fun we should go do that go check in with our boy cam oh man that's dangerous for all involved yes it is very we dangerous we should definitely do that 
I have a feeling that Cam could outdrink both of us, maybe combined. Anyways, we'd have a good time though. Oh, that, that that's for sure. We sure would. Um, Mike, at the very least, I think 2018 looks better for Miami, but I, I will say that that is a bit contingent on a more reliable quarterback situation, whether that's Malik Rozier improving enough to where he doesn't turn into a liability at points, or if it's bringing in you know someone like a Nikosi Perry or someone else that uh, provides a different dimension to the offense. I'm not totally sure at this point what that looks like. I've mentioned this before, but I'm also a little bit skeptical of what Mark Richt is going to do uh, from a QB standpoint. I'm, I'm a little bit jaded into thinking that he's just going to uh, stick with his guy and show loyalty more so than maybe make the decision that might give him a better chance to win, regardless of what he says in the press. But um, something to keep an eye on as, as we go through the offseason here and, and into preseason camp is what's going on with the quarterback situation here, because – I have a feeling that if Malik Rozier is the option starting out against LSU, uh, you might be in for a, a bit of a rough ride at certain points during the season if you're Miami. Or certainly, again, another ride where games are coming out a lot closer than they probably should be. I agree. Uh, outlook's better. This is a potential undefeated Miami team, I think, looking at the regular season schedule. There are a couple tricky games in there, but... I mean, talent-wise, they stack up with each and every team on the regular season schedule. So, yeah, this could be this could be eleven and one, twelve and zero range. I think potentially, um, and, and you know, that's that's with Malik Rozier. I think honestly, uh, I'll call my therapist. Yeah, I don't want to watch any more of Malik Rozier. I mean, I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast because I don't want to just completely offend him but bro i do not want to watch you play anymore trying to catch these hands mike trying to catch them hands man i catch them rosier hands yeah see if i'll bring the turnover chain while he's at it oh, but, excuse me the damn turnover chain right they're gonna need a turnover quarterback i think <laughs> malik rosier giving up more turnover chains than he already was anyways uh that's all I got on Miami. Mike. Yeah, Mark, Mark Rick will be wearing the turnover chain. Yep. Yeah, he, like, he hey, scored that one. Hey, Malik Rozier, sorry. <laughs> uh, Good um, stuff. Man. Mike, that's all I got. Anything else? No, nah, I think I'm good. Let's get out of here. We got one more to do. Miami, the Coastal Champs. Uh, again, a, a really good 2017. Might be an even better 2018. Uh, they won the Coastal Division. They lost uh, to Clemson in Charlotte. That is the last team that we got to cover. So we're going to come back and do that. In the meantime, you guys can follow us on Twitter. I am at FTRS Joey. He is at Mike McDaniel CFB, no longer at Mike McDaniel ACC. So go Surprise. check him out there. Uh, and together we're at BC Podcast ACC. Uh, Y'all can send us an email to the longest email address known to man, basketballconferencepodcast at gmail.com. Nailed it. I fully expect to get some Miami fan hate mail. I mean, we kind of got used to that this season. So we only showered them with comp with um, I almost said confidence. They they're not short of confidence. They don't need they don't need any confidence from me. That's a fair uh, assessment. Yeah, we only showered them with compliments for the last 20 minutes. That's 20 minutes of my life. I'll never have back so they can go screw. I know that, that's a good motto for the for the podcast. Just go screw. Uh. <laughs> Man, this is going off the rails. Mike, where can they find him on the social medias? Facebook.com slash basketball conference rate review. Find all of our podcasts there, Joey. Hell yeah. Do that. Also, by the way, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, the Overcast app, and wherever fine podcasts are sold for free. You can also find us on YouTube. We don't have a special URL. Just go go search for basketball conference on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, we're going to be posting these podcasts there. This is where we're recording them, uh, especially when you get towards the season. We'll be posting you know, times where you can come and watch in if you're not really doing anything else with your Tuesday night. So uh, come check us out. Mike, you want to come back and uh, finish out this recap series yes, that we're doing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, until then, for Mr. Mike McDaniel, I am Joey Weaver. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll talk to you again soon. And until then, go ACC.